I'd like to, to share a few thoughts with some of our leaders in our church uh, that have been on my heart recently as I've been counseling with people. And this is an application I'd like to make to my life. Uh, certainly would share these things and have shared them with Eric, uh, our other elders and our deacons from time to time. When we think about what kind of men we ought to be as leaders at Berean Baptist Church, I'm talking about pastors, elders, and deacons, and, and the principles that I'm going to share here would, would apply to everybody in our church as well. A passage comes to my mind in 2 Timothy, and in this uh, book of Timothy that Paul writes to this young man, he talks about the servants of the Lord, and he says a few things that I think are very appropriate for all of us to remember and to try to practice in our walk with God and in our service to the King of Kings. He says, first of all, in verse 22 of chapter 2, he says to Timothy, Timothy, flee also youthful lusts. Youthful lusts are passions that are particularly uh, troublesome to us in our youth. If we don't mortify our lusts and our sins and our passions uh, when we're young, they have a tendency, those youthful lusts, to follow us through life. I think one of the tragedies uh, is that perhaps many of us have allowed youthful lust in, at times to follow us into our old age. We always battle the flesh. Now youthful lust could be, we think of young men, we think of the, the lust of the flesh, uh, the pride of life, uh, we think of, of sensuality and impurity, but there's also the lust for pride uh, or the lust for recognition or the lust for position, uh, the lust to be uh, important, the lust to be over someone else, um, uh, lust that leads us to be envious or jealous, contentious or divisive. But these are youthful lusts. He says, flee these things. We need to mortify them as leaders so that as we lead in, in our positions as pastors, elders, and deacons, that we actually, in fact, are, are men that people can emulate, follow our example, look up to us, and respect. He goes on and he says, not only do we flee youthful lust, but pursue, he says, righteousness. I don't believe this is imputed righteousness. We take that uh, as a gift from God imputed to our account when we become believers. Our sins are laid on Christ and His righteousness is laid on us. But pursuing righteousness here, I believe, means pursuing holiness, pursuing a godly life, being conformed into the image of Christ. And that means we want to obey the commandments and the teachings of the Word of God all those precepts, all those uh, regulations or laws that are taught us by Christ and his apostles and, and the moral principles that come to us out of the Old Testament law as well. We are to pursue righteousness. And then he talks about pursuing righteousness, pursue faith. Leaders, godly leaders, need to be men of faith. They need to have faith in God. They need to believe that no matter what we face, what trial, what opposition, what difficulty, what burden may come up that our God is greater than the enemy. Greater is he that's in you, we're told in Scripture, than he that's in the world. We have to have faith, great faith in God. So pursue righteousness, pursue faith, and pursue love. He says, love and, and peace with all men. What should characterize a godly leader is that they should be men who are righteous, pure and holy, that they are men that are filled by the Holy Spirit, that they... Uh, demonstrate agape love in the way they work with people, the way they respond to people, the way they handle problems and situations. Uh, they ought to also, as we think of these men, be at peace with all those who call upon the Lord with a pure heart. We need to, as all, at all times to work hard at being peacemakers. God's leaders, pastors, elders, and deacons need to be those who strive to keep the unity and the peace in the body of Christ. He also goes on in verse 23, and then he says, But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. One of the things I've learned over many years of ministry, I've been at Berean over about 30 years now, been in the ministry uh, up to 40 years altogether, preaching the gospel for 46 years. One of the things that I've learned is that you need to know what hills to die on, what issues to make uh, major issues, and what things to say these are not worth causing strife over. One of the things that I've seen so many times in the church is that uh, disputes arise, questions arise uh, over non-essential items and issues, and people get their feelings hurt, people get upset, people divide. Sometimes fractions and divisions begin in the church, and people leave. 
because of things that should never have been allowed to be discussed or carried on in, in such a way. We'd be wise as elders and deacons and pastors to, to be praying and to be knowing what are the main issues that we should be concerned about, what things are we willing to, to die for, what things are, are certainly maybe personal preference, things that are not major issues. It takes a great deal of wisdom to know that. He goes on and he says, The servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. One of the things that I have really worked hard at, that when anyone ever comes into my office, whether they come angry, whether they come politely, whether they come with a criticism or a concern, to always be like Christ, to respond patiently, with gentleness, to have an open ear. Uh, and I've, I get, I, in my ministry, I cannot recall a time that someone has come into my office where I got angry or resisted them or rebuked them severely. I've always tried to be a, a gracious servant of the Lord. Now, there's times we have to deal with sin. There are times we have to deal directly with it. But I've always tried to be like Christ in the way I've handled situations. And he says, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. Gentleness is a quality. It's not weakness. It's, it's a quality and it's a strength. And it makes us like the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep in mind, we do know... Uh, we do need to know when it's time to take a strong and firm stand, but taking a strong, firm stand does not mean that we're unkind, does not mean that we're rude, does not mean that we hurt people. And then he goes on, uh, the servant of the Lord must be able to teach and be patient. Uh, patience is one of the key features of a man who's going to be a pastor, an elder, or a deacon, or a leader in the church. He says, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Why does he say in humility? I think Paul understands that we're all men. We're men of clay, and, and it's, it's possible that all of us can fall prey to the certain temptations of the flesh, certain sins of the age of the day. And so in humility, when someone comes to us, and, or we have to deal with somebody in the church who is involved in some particular uh, failure or sin or digression or they've wandered or they've backslidden, we need to go to them with great humility, considering ourselves, knowing how frail and weak we are and how prone to wander each of us are as well. These are just basic concepts that teach us how we as leaders need to work and walk with one another. The whole purpose of, of leadership in the church, pastors and elders and deacons, is for us to be guardians of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's our responsibility to protect the unity of our flock, the love of our flock, to protect the, the doctrine, uh, the direction that we're going, and to do it with a heart that yearns for God's glory. Recently I was reading Richard Baxter's uh, great treatise, it's on the Christian directory. It's a massive volume of very practical applications on the Christian life written by an old Puritan, Richard Baxter. I came across a quote that, that really surprised me. Uh, he, he said that godliness in those who are walking with the Lord and loving the Lord is to be addicted to God. And the phrase he used, addicted to God, startled me. I just did not expect that coming from Richard Baxter, a Puritan, uh, back in the 15th century, or the 16th century. Uh, it just amazed me. And I thought, that's what, what we as leaders and pastors, elders, deacons, and can I say to all the folks at Berean, we all, wouldn't it be wonderful if we all could say that in our heart, in our passion for Christ, that we have literally become, by God's grace, addicted to the God of the Bible, to where our love for Him, our devotion to Him, our following Him, our pursuing of Him, uh, is, is like being addicted to something so precious and so wonderful. So let me just close once again and say, as I think about our leaders and the men in our church, and this would again apply in a secondary way to every single member at Berean Baptist Church, when I think of what we, we do in our lives, let me just say this once again. May we all flee, not just youthful lusts, but any passions, any desires, any illicit uh, lusts that may follow us through life. Let us flee these things. Let's pursue righteousness, pursue faith, pursue peace with all men. May we be gentle. May we be approachable. May we be a godly people. And most of all, as we think of these things, may we have an addiction to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his gospel, that we might live for his glory.